Let me pray for us, and we'll get right into our study for tonight. Father, we stop again and say thank you for the gift that you've given us to come and to study your word. We thank you for the privilege that we have and the gift of living in these times in which we have the ability all around the country to sit and at a computer or a television or an iPad or a phone or whatever and just be a part of the study together. And we thank you for those that are listening right now and watching in Virginia and Tennessee that we know about and South Carolina and other places that people in Chicago are, are, have been saying that they've been following along. We just thank you and we praise you for it and we give you the praise and the glory. But Lord, at the same time, as much as we thank you for these days that we live, we also know that these days we live in, your word said, are going to get worse and worse and that's happening on our globe right now. And Father, we ask for your peace, that the church, the, the, the real true church would be used by you to be the salt and the light that slows the decay in this world. Lord, we know we're not going to turn the world around and have the whole world come to faith. That's not going to happen. Your word is clear that wides the path that goes to destruction and many go that way and narrows the road that leads to eternal life and few there be that find it. But you also have said that we're to be the salt and the light. And Lord, as someone has even already said tonight, if things are this bad, while the church is still here, what will it be like after we're gone? But Lord, as much as it's tempting for us to say, Lord, just come get us and get us off this planet. Lord, we want to be used by you for your purposes and for your plan here on this earth so others would come to know you. So Lord, in this time of chaos, in this time of unrest, in this time of no peace, Father, may the Prince of Peace be introduced to people around the globe. There'll be no real peace on this earth until Jesus comes and sets up his kingdom. And as we know from your word, there's a lot of other stuff that's going to go on between now and then. At this time, Father, we ask for Jesus through his church and the Holy Spirit's power through his church that true peace would begin to spread as people are pointed to Jesus. We pray that this study does that as well tonight, that it reminds us, those of us who are yours, who are here in this place and listening online, Father, or watching maybe a couple of days later on the video that's going to be replayed, Father, we ask that you would speak to us tonight in such a way that we would be reminded of whose we are, what we've been given, to the point that we be take our eyes off of ourselves and put them back where they belong. Lord, everybody's living for self right now, and unfortunately, sometimes we in the church fall into that category as well. You love us tonight, but you also want to reprove us a little bit. And so, Lord, tonight, take us where you want us to go. We humble ourselves and we sit at your feet and we say, teach us, Jesus. In your name we pray these things. Amen. Matthew chapter 19, verses 23 through 30. Matthew chapter 19, verses 23 through 30. And Jesus said to his disciples, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Then Peter said in reply, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Now, if you were with us last week, you realize we're picking up in the midst of our study, in the midst of a story that we saw uh, from last week, where the rich young man had just come to ask Jesus what he should do to inherit eternal life. As you remember from our study last week, we looked at the fact that salvation is not by what we do or what we even have, but actually it's received when we realize what we don't have. Uh, let me just take you back there. Go back to Matthew chapter 5. Go to Matthew chapter 5 and look at verses 1 through 6. Back when Jesus was laying the foundation for the gospel in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, it says, Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are those who are meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. 
Now, let me just remind you, the scriptures here teaching that in order to be saved, you need to not think about what you have or what you can do, but what you don't have and what you need and your need of righteousness and how it needs to be given to you as a gift. The rich young ruler had come and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus had to kind of teach him that salvation is not by what you do. But he did it in a very interesting way. If you remember, he took him to the law, and the law's purpose was to show that we can't keep it. And, but unfortunately, this man still had a problem, even though God used the law in a couple of forms to reveal to him his problem and his sin that was keeping him from salvation. And that was his love of money and things more than his love of the Lord. Uh, Jesus, uh, he worked in such a way that the young man went away sorrowful. You remember last week we saw that he realized the choice he had made. He knew what Jesus had said, but he wasn't willing to do it, and he went away sorrowful. Now, Jesus showed him that his heart was more in love with his money and his possessions than he was in love with God. Go with me back to Matthew chapter 6 real quick and look at verses 19 through 21. It's a familiar passage. We're going to look at it a couple of times tonight because there's a lot here that ties to where we're going as well, where we are and where we're going. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21, Jesus says this. He says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He says, you need to be laying up treasure, not here on the earth, where, especially those of us who live on the beach, we understand about how rust destroys, don't we? Isn't it amazing? For those of you that don't live on the beach side, your air conditioning lasts a lot longer than ours. We replace our outside unit every three to five years, whether we want to or not, because it rusts away. I remember when our kids were little and we would buy a basketball goal and we put it on the driveway and set it up. Within a year and a half, you could almost count to the day that it was going to fall over. It was almost like, oh, it's been a year and a half. Move the car so it doesn't fall over onto the car because the pole would rust away. Living on the beach is one of the privileges of living there. But at the same time, he says, look, you guys, you're storing up treasure where thieves can steal and moths can, moth can destroy. Joy. store up your treasure in a place where there's not going to be any thieves, where there's not going to be any rust, or anything like that. Store your treasure there. But then he says this. He says, because where your treasure is, that's where your heart's going to be. And he's really talking about the fact that if our hearts are toward God, as you're going to see tonight, and if our hearts are toward what is to come, not this life, or, or actually, let me back it up. If our treasure is in God and our treasure is in what's to come, our heart will follow. And I'm just going to encourage you. You want to have a heart for God? Put your money in your heart and your thoughts toward those things of God. Your heart will follow. I promise you. Put your attention there. And you're going to see that tonight in our study. So we saw last week, though, that, when, that Jesus pointed out the rich man. Sorry, he, we saw last week that Jesus pointed out that the rich in this world will have a harder time entering the kingdom of God than the poor because they have more to distract them and pull them away from pure devotion to Christ. We're going to take a look at some scriptures that talk about that. Let me just quickly just touch on Jesus saying it's harder for a, a, a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into heaven. For years, different preachers have said, well, there was this place called the eye. No, there really wasn't. He was just simply saying, and using a very common phrase that they would say over there in that part of the world, it was actually tied to an elephant, you know, and, uh, and it's harder for an elephant to go through an eye of a needle. But he just changed it to a camel because that was an animal that they knew very well and was very large. There was not this place that was hard to get through. He was just simply using a crazy statement to say it's harder for a camel to go through an iron needle than for a rich person to get into heaven. Now, when he said this, what was Peter's response? What was everybody's response? Well, who then can be saved? Because they had been taught their whole life that the rich were the ones that God was pleased with, and he was the one they were blessing, and that means they were righteous. And they were not only righteous, they had more money to give more things, because those who gave are the ones who earned more heaven. And they were just like, this blows our brains up. And of course, God says, with man, salvation is impossible. Let me say that to you again. With man, salvation is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. But now, what I want to do is I want to show you some scriptures that deal with the fact that the reason it's hard for a rich person to get into heaven is not because if you're rich, you're not going to heaven. No, the Bible teaches that there were many people who were men of women, women of faith, who were very wealthy. Abraham and Isaac and uh, many others had a lot of possessions. King David himself, Solomon. But at the same time, it's not being rich that's a problem. It's just that when you have many things, it's harder 
for you to be fully devoted to Christ because there's so many other things that pull on you. So go with me to James chapter 2 and look at verse 5. And we'll just kind of let the scripture kind of lay this foundation for us because it will help us in where we're going tonight. I'll be honest with you, I can't wait to kind of put the end of 19 and the beginning of chapter 20 together. You would think that they don't go together, but they do, and I cannot wait to show you how they do. In James chapter 2, look at verse 5. The scripture says, Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he has promised to those who what? Those who love him. In this section of chapter 2 where he's talking about how the church was treating the rich people in the church better than the poor, he's like, guys, have you lost sight of the fact that it's the poor in this world who have been blessed by God to be rich in faith? You know why the poor people are rich in faith? It's all they got. They have no choice but to trust in God and to have faith in God because all the other stuff that pulls us away from trusting God, they don't have. It's easier for a poor person to trust God. People always look at the church and say, well, it's full, it's full of all those weirdos and people that are needy and strange and dependent. Yep. We're going to look weird compared to the rest of the world. We are needy. We are dependent. We wouldn't be saved if it wasn't for Jesus. It's not tied to how much we have. We're not parading who we are when we come in. We come in and say we're here because of Jesus, and you're here because of Jesus, and I love you because he loves us, and we're family. Yeah, we may look strange to the world. Jesus even said through Paul to the church in Corinth, look, he didn't choose the wise and the impressive. He chose the ones that would give him the most glory. And so the poor in this world don't have as much pulling them away. Do you all realize that money makes the same promises that God makes? Doesn't God say that I'll take care of you? Money says, I'll take care of you. God says, I'll provide for you, and I'll provide for your needs. Money says, I'll provide for you, provide for your needs. God says, I'll be there when you need me. Money says, I'll be there when you need me. Money makes all the same promises God does. It just can't keep it. And the poor in this world don't have that tug. Go to James chapter 1. Look at verse 12. James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who what? Wait a minute. What has just been brought out in both of these passages, James 2, 5 and James 1, 12? Those who love him. Folks, I want you to hear something. You're going to see tonight from the scriptures that the Bible is teaching, it's those who have a full devotion to Christ who are the ones who are saved. Those who have a full devotion to Christ who are rich in faith. A full devotion to Christ. A love for Christ. Go to Luke chapter 12. Look at verses 13 through 21. In Luke chapter 12, Verses 13 through 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. By the way, you'd be amazed how many preachers over the years have someone come to them with that same type of a, I have this issue with my brother or issue with my cousin or I have issue with this person. And they, they want the preacher to get involved and settle the dispute. Jesus says, man, who made me judge over arbitrator over you? And he then told them a story. He said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do, for I have nowhere to store my crops? And he said, I'll do this. I'll tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I'll store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for for many, many years, relax, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not what? Rich toward God. Again, you starting to see the context here? A full devotion to Christ. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Actually, write this one down. Look at it later on. 1 Corinthians 7, 32 through 35. In this section... Paul's talking about being married and unmarried and all this. And he makes an interesting little statement. He's saying, look, I'm not saying you can't get married because God designed marriage and it's a great thing. But he said single people have more opportunity to be fully devoted to Christ. 
They don't have the tug of their spouse. And he talk, and uses that illustration of being fully devoted to Christ. Now, in our passage for tonight, though, we see Peter quickly point out to Jesus that they've left everything to follow him. Remember, he said, it's hard for a rich person to get into heaven. It's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich person to get into heaven. And Peter says, hey, in case you didn't notice, we've left everything. For, you know, are you paying attention? I'm going to point out three things from this path, from the scriptures about that. Here's the first thing. Scripture shows that they did leave everything to follow him. Go with me to Matthew chapter 4. Look at verses 18 through 22. In Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 22. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he, Jesus, saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Some of your gospel accounts of the gathering of the disciples said they left everything and followed him. Left dad, left the nets, left it all, and followed Jesus. So the first thing I want you to realize is Scripture shows they did leave everything. Peter wasn't making that up. He really did. They did. But also, the second thing I want you to see is that Jesus knows what you have and what you don't have, and he knows how much you've given up for him. He does keep track. Peter's saying, Lord, I don't know if you noticed or not, but we've left everything to follow you. And I want you to hear something. I sometimes wonder, and I shouldn't, but I do because I'm as human as you. Did God pay attention to that? I'm always making sure my wife's keeping track when I'm trying to get points. I'm always pointing out. Do you, you notice what I just did there? I just put those dishes in without even being asked in the dishwasher. And she then points out that when you point it out, you lose the points. But I was just like, I wasn't sure you had really paid attention. I want to make sure I'm getting... God knows he's paying attention. Let me give you an illustration of that. Go to Mark chapter 12. In Mark chapter 12, look at verses 41 through 44. We'll get there. There we go. And he sat down. This is Jesus sat down opposite the treasury and he watched the people putting money into the offering box. Many rich people put in large sums and a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. And he called his disciple to him and he said, truly, I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all she had. To live on. Now, how did Jesus know that? By the way, that was a question. He's God. He knows everything. He knows the thoughts of every one of us. He knows the thoughts before they make it to our mouths. There's nothing he doesn't know. Folks, not only had the disciples left everything, Jesus knew. He knew. Now, there's a third thing I want to bring out about Peter saying, see, we've left everything. First off, notice how Jesus doesn't rebuke Peter for asking for about a future reward. But he actually promises it will come. Go back to Matthew chapter 19. Look again at verse 29. He said, And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sister or father or mothers or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. He has just said, of course, we've left everything. And Jesus is actually going to sit on 12 thrones. We're going to get to that in just a second. But I want you to see that Jesus doesn't rebuke Peter for saying, what will there be for us? What about a future reward? We've left everything in this life. You've told us to store up treasure in heaven. Are you paying attention? Are we going to get credit? By the way, this is very important for where we're going to go tonight because you're going to see a curveball come in just a little bit. Jesus promises future reward for those of us who are willing not to live for this life and are willing to give up things in this life in view of the life to come. If you're willing to be in full devotion to Christ and let him determine where you go, what you do, who you marry, who you don't marry, whether you're single, whether you're married, whether you get to do the career you want or whether you're going to do what he wants. When you are willing to be in full devotion to Christ, the Bible teaches that God knows he's paying attention, he's keeping track, and you're storing up reward in heaven. And by the way, 
when Jesus said you will be rewarded in heaven, what was the word he used here? How much? Hundredfold. It'll be exponentially. Uh, well, let me just ask you this question. Any of you, your earthly um, savings accounts or business, are you making a hundredfold on your investment? I think a hundredfold is pretty good. So what I want to do is I want to show you how the scripture teaches that we are to be looking for a future reward. We're to be living for a future reward. A lot of people have said over the years, I just want to just get to heaven. That's good enough. The Bible teaches that we're to be looking for a reward in heaven. Let me show you some more. Go to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Look at verses 32 through 39. And I apologize for those of you on the camera. I've just realized I haven't looked at you a whole lot tonight. I've been looking around the room, but I've seen you on the camera for weeks. I've got people here now. So uh, Hebrews chapter 10. Look at verses 32 through 39. But recall the former days, the scripture says, when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with suffering, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison. You joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. So he says, look, wait. Your reward is coming. God will give you what he's promised. You're in chapter 10. Turn over to chapter 11. Let's look at a couple of people, men and women of faith here in Hebrews 11. In Hebrews 11, look at verses 8 through 10 about Abraham. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, he li living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. That land that he was sent to, that God was going to give to him and his descendants, which will be experienced in the millennial kingdom, he didn't even know where it was. And how many of us will say, well, Lord, can I look at it first? Can I see how it's going to play out before I say yes? He didn't even know where he was going. But he also knew that God had promised him a land and a place and an inheritance. And he trusted that God's plan and design for him was better than his. By the way, as you know, it, he gave up quite a bit to go to do that, did he not? He was in a wealthy family. We'll go to chapter 11, look at verses 24 through 26. Moses did it as well. In Moses' in Moses' story in Hebrews eleven twenty four, by faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to what? The reward. He was looking to the reward. We already saw Matthew chapter 6, 19 through 21, store up treasure in heaven. Go to Galatians chapter 6, look at verse 9. Now I'm laying this foundation of these scriptures because I want you to see it because it's going to be very helpful for us in a little bit. Because like I say, we're about to get into chapter 20 and get a curveball, but they go together. Galatians chapter 6, look at verse 9. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. The Bible promises reward. Peter was not rebuked for saying, what there, will there be for us? Jesus didn't say you shouldn't have that attitude. He actually says, let me just tell you something. Those of you that have left family and houses and mothers and father and lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. Go to Revelation 22. Look at what Jesus says in the last book of the Bible. In Revelation 22, verse 12, Jesus says, Behold, I'm coming soon, bringing my recompense. Some of your translations say reward. That's a fine translation. Behold, I'm coming soon, bringing my reward with me to repay each one for what is done. When he comes, we're going to experience the judgment seat of 
Christ. Well, where is that, Jim? Glad you asked. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Look at verses 1 through 10. When Jesus comes to gather his church, a lot of people are saying, man, I'm ready for Jesus to come. I'm ready for Jesus to come. Okay, are you? Because the first place he's going to take you is the judgment seat. I thought we weren't going to be judged. No, no, no. We're not going to be judged whether or not we get into heaven. That's the, the, the unrighteous. That's the lost. Those are the people going to the great white throne judgment. They're the ones all going to the lake of fire because they haven't trusted in Christ. And they will be judged for all of their works because they didn't receive Christ's forgiveness and his pay payment. But for those of us who are in Christ, we will receive a judgment. A judgment is coming. We're being judged now on this earth as he's purifying his bride and getting us ready. At the same time, when he comes to gather us, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 10 says this. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God. Now, this tent he's referring to as our bodies, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling, if indeed by putting it on we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, that we would be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we're always of good courage. We know that while we're at home in the body, we're away from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Yes, we're of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we're at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. Why? Because we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Is he talking to Christians or -Christian, non-Christians here? Christians. We're going to be judged by what we did after salvation, and you're going to either be rewarded or you're going to suffer loss. There's a judgment coming for Christians, and the Bible says that we need to be striving to have full devotion to Christ, not living for selves, not living the way the world says to, not looking at things the way the world says to. And let me just say this to you, Christians. I want to hear you to hear me right now. It is so easy for us Christians to get caught up in the negativity of what's going on. Even if you consider yourself on the other side from the rest of the world's mindset, Christians are still getting just as negative complaining about unrighteousness. I can't believe those liberals this or that and the other. I can't believe the conservatives this, that. I can't. Listen, if you're sitting there complaining about what's going on, your eyes aren't on Christ. Because the evidence of the fact that the Spirit of God is within us is going to be love and joy and peace and patience. What's that next one? Kindness, gentleness, self-control. Folks, if the Christians are just up in, is up, in, up in arms as much as all the unrighteous people, complaining on our side, we're no different. And don't think, well, I'm complaining about righteousness. No, you're not. You're complaining about righteousness in an unrighteous way, which makes it unrighteous. Let your peace, your gentleness, be evident to all. The Lord is near. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'm going to say rejoice. Are we living in a crazy time? Sure. Is there a possibility I've heard on the way in that some of us might have trouble getting home because there might be a, a, a protest on A1A? Possibly. Take a deep breath. God's still in control. And it's time that the world saw that we actually have faith in a big God. Jesus even tells these guys that they're going to sit, the tw these apostles, that they're going to sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. He says, you guys are going to sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Go to Revelation chapter 20. Look at verses 1 through 6. This is going to happen during the millennial kingdom. Revelation 20 talks to us about this thousand year period where Jesus is going to come and reign on the earth and it, by the way when he talked about coming and sitting on his glorious throne people always think that's in heaven no you go look at Matthew 25 in the parable of the sheep and the goats it says when the son of man comes to the earth in his glory he's going to sit on his glorious throne guess what the glorious throne is folks it's on the earth in Revelation chapter 20 look at verses 1 through 6 
Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit. By the way, where was Satan when he was grabbed and bound? He was on the earth. Remember, at this point, he's been cast out of heaven down to the earth. And he threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. And I also saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus for the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead didn't come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed is the one who shares in this resurrection, first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. So when Jesus comes back to this earth and sets up his kingdom on the earth, there's going to be actually, as you've seen us in our Revelation study, there's going to be a Jewish government, and there's going to be a Gentile government. And the 12 apostles are going to be reigning over the 12 tribes of Israel and ruling and judging on 12 thrones with Jesus. We who are going to be given those responsibilities because of our faithfulness on this earth, some of us are going to be ruling and reigning more than others because how faithful we've been, how much we've stored up in heaven is going to be tied to our future reward. That's why 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says that some are going to suffer loss. They themselves will be saved, but only as one escape in flames. Folks, you can get to heaven and miss out on a lot of reward. Yes, you're in heaven, but you're going to miss out. The Bible teaches us to have a full devotion to Christ and to store up treasure in heaven. We should be looking for the return of Jesus and the reward. And the reward is tied to what we've done in the body after salvation, whether good or bad or evil. In other words, that word translated bad or evil is actually a word that could be translated worthless. It's either worth something, which we rewarded for, or it's worthless. And a lot of us, unfortunately, have done a lot of things that are worthless. And let me say something to you as well. Some of you might have been super, super, super faithful in the church and working really hard in your own strength for years. And the Bible says it'll burn up and it's worthless because if Christ didn't do it, you won't be rewarded for it. Keep that in mind, by the way, for the curveball that's coming. We in the church are going to reign with Christ during this future time as well as I've hinted at. But let me just give you a couple of scriptures that show you that. Go to Revelation chapter 3. Look at verses 21 and 22. In Revelation chapter 3, verses 21 and 22, Jesus is speaking to the church in Laodicea, but he also is speaking to the church as, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He was an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the church as, plural. Write it down, look at it later on. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. 2 Timothy 2, 12 talks about how We will reign with him. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Look at verses 1 through 3. This one's kind of hard for us to fathom and grasp, but the Bible's true. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Look at verses 1 through 3. It says, When one of you in the church has a grievance against another, does he dare go to uh, to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge who? The world. And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? Here is there was lawsuits among believers in the church there in Corinth. Paul says, let me remind you, we're one day going to judge the world. We're going to rule over the world and we're going to make decisions in righteousness over the world. We're going to reign with Christ on this earth. And some of you may not even fully understand this or understand this at all. But we're going to also judge angels. We've been created lower than the angels, but in that time that we're going to be rewarded for the faithfulness on this earth and letting Christ be the one who determines how our life goes, not us, not living for self. 2 Corinthians 5.15, that the one who died should no longer live for himself, but the one who the one, one had been saved no longer live for themselves, but the one who died for him. And when we are faithful, God says, one day I'm going to take you and you're going to rule over the angels. You're created lower than the angels, I'm going to make you over them. And he says, you guys can't even settle simple disputes in the church. You don't even fully understand where you're headed, what's coming. So we're going to rule and reign with him. So 
that has been the foundation for where we need to go for chapter 20. Turn over to Matthew chapter 20. Here we see that the Bible teaches in the end of 19 that there is going to be a future reward for those who are willing to be in full devotion to Christ, not live for this life, but live for the life to come. But then he tells a story in Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. Let me read it to you. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard, and going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to them he said, You go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went, going out again about the sixth hour, and the ninth hour he did the same. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing, and he said to them, Why do you stand here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last up to the first. And when those hired about the 11th hour, who'd only worked one hour, came, each of them came, each of them received the denarius. Now, when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I'm, not, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first, and the first last. Did anybody notice he ends both stories, both passages with that same phrase? He ends chapter 19, and here in chapter 20 and verse 16, he ends it the same thing. The last will be first, and the first last. So here's an interesting thing. Like I said, this is tied to where we just left off. Jesus promised reward for those who give up their plans for this life and follow Christ and his plans. And a natural tendency would be to use this information to compete with each other for future reward. But to think in this way would be to miss the point that not only is salvation a gift from God, but our eternal reward is, all, reward is also by his grace. Let me say that to you again. I want you to see this. Would you not agree that your salvation is totally by His grace and not by anything you've done? Don't miss the second part. Anything that you'll be rewarded for in heaven, you didn't do it either. Any reward we get that He's telling us to store up is still totally by His grace. Because as you hopefully are coming to understand, we'll only be rewarded for what he has done. You're going to see that in the scriptures in just a second, but many of us, I'm sure you did warn as well, we all grew up hearing that phrase, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Sounds good, doesn't it? But that's not right. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done by Christ, through Christ, will last. You'll never be rewarded for what you did and your hard work, and your faithfulness, and your commitment. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. The church in Corinth had a problem, which was very common to all churches. They were jockeying for position, glorifying one person over another. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, look at verses 1 through 7. Paul said, this is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it's required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself, for I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I'm not thereby acquitted. It's the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. Now, before I finish reading, because we're going to go into verse 7, let me just kind of point out to what he's saying here. 
He said, don't make any judgments about the other people in the church as to who you think is doing a better job because actually you're probably not going to make a right judgment. And Paul said, I'm not even going to judge myself because I probably won't even give myself a fair right assessment. It's God who knows the heart. We could all look around and say, I think that person's working hard for Christ and that one's not. And you may find out on the day of reward that that person that you didn't think was doing anything was actually doing everything that God had for them to do and they were doing it behind the scenes and nobody knew. And this person that was prominent in the church who was always doing stuff that everybody was bragging about ends up getting very little reward because it wasn't done by Christ and they were doing it for the attention. Don't make assessments around. Don't look around. Don't compare yourself to other people in the room, folks. Don't compare yourself to other Christians. Don't fall into that trap of thinking, well, I'm not like that guy or I'm not like him. They're so much better than me. Don't fall into that because you really don't know. But one day... The one who does, remember the one who's keeping track of what you have and what you don't have and what you've given up? One day, he's going to make it all good. And then Paul says this, look at verse uh, 6. He says, I've applied these things to myself and to Paulus for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? And if then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Folks, let me just say something to you straight up. For years, I've had people say, Jim, you've been blessed by God with such an incredible memory. The answer is yes. I have been blessed by God. That doesn't make me any better than anybody else. And to be honest with you, with great blessings come great tests. And whatever you're blessed in and whatever is your gift, could also be your curse because you could rely on it instead of the Lord. And folks, as much as Jesus is teaching us to store up treasure and to store up reward, and we are to do it, don't fall into that mindset that starts to think where you're going to get more than somebody else and where you start comparing yourself and measuring yourself in this life against other people. One, you really don't know how much that person has been faithful because God knows what they're doing in secret and where their hearts really are, and he's going to reward the heart, not the outward action. And let me just say something to you for right now, and I hate if this steps on some toes in here, but i got to just speak the truth. It's something God showed me tonight as I was praying over where we're going to go for years. Have we not heard people say, well, I'm a charter member? I've been in this church for how many years? And we think we have privilege because of how long we've been here and how long we've worked. And we've been here longer than them and they should listen to us more. Sure sounds like those workers in the vineyard, doesn't it? We're not done. We tend to always gravitate towards wanting things fair. You really don't. First off, you don't know what fair really means. God is just. Did he not give them what he agreed with them that he would give them? When they said he was unfair and unjust, he said, whoa, 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 hang on for a second. Did I not give you what I agreed with you and you agreed with me? I, I, I worked, you said, if you would work all day, I'll pay you a denarius and you agreed. Did I not give you? Well, did I not do what I said I would do? God is just. He will do everything he said. He will never lie. He will never break his promises. And folks, let me just remind you, you don't want things fair. If things were fair, there would be no mercy. If things were fair, there would be no grace. If, is it fair that we get to go to heaven because Jesus was punished for our sins? Isn't that crazy? As we walk around, this isn't fair. Yet we brag about the fact that we're going to heaven because Jesus died for our sins. Is it fair that he was punished? The one who lived the sinless life, is it fair that he was put to death for what you did and you get to go to heaven? You don't want it fair. You want a just God who will do what he says. And he's promised that if you'll believe that he punished himself, his own son, in your place, he will give you eternal life. You say, thank you. Go to Titus chapter 3. Go to Titus chapter 3. Look at verses 3 through 7. Titus chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. 
For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and the loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. So that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. He saved us. Why? Because of how good we were, how hard we worked. No, because of his mercy and his grace that he's richly poured out on us. If you go back to that story we read in Matthew 20, the master of the house says, your problem is not really with my seeming unfairness. Your problem is with my generosity. If I want to give this person who worked only one hour the same as I gave you who worked all day, don't I have the right to do it however I want? And that's what Paul says in Romans chapter 9, where some people have tried to take it and make it say that God's determined some people are going to hell and some people are going to heaven and man doesn't have a choice. That's not what the Bible says. But Paul's saying you need to have an attitude that says, what if he did? He has every right to do things in his world however he wants. None of us had any say whether or not we were going to be born. Yet we all come into this world wanting to be in charge. And what's going on nowadays is the problem that we've all had within us is now exacerbated because of social media. And everybody's got an opinion. We've all got opinions. But we've learned over the years to keep them quiet, haven't we? But now with social media, everybody has an opinion and everybody's opinion is more important than everybody else's opinion. And we're all getting up in arms because someone hadn't got as upset about something as I got upset about. And boom, boom, boom. And we're attacking each other and tearing each other apart. What it is, is the fact that we all want to be God is manifesting itself. That's really what's going on in this world. The evilness of mankind is being seen. And the church today, instead of falling on their knees and saying, God, help. We sit around and call each other and type and Skype and complain. We make ourselves feel good because we're grumbling with everybody else that feels the same way we do. Whether or not people should wear a mask or not wear a mask and all this stuff. And we sit around complaining. Folks, let me say something to you. If you're listening online, it's time that the world see Jesus. Many is the time we see in the Bible that the disciples got all up in arms. You want us to call fire down on them? Jesus says, relax. We saw some people preaching in your name and they weren't part of our group. Relax. God's still in control, folks. Everything's right on schedule. We need to pray. And then we need to know what he said. And we need to let him love people through us how he tells us to do it. And don't you determine how everybody else should be doing it, what God told you. You just do what God told you and you leave everybody else alone. I'm sorry? The fields are ripe. No, Jesus pointed out in this story, fairness wasn't the issue. The issue was with his generosity. When God is generous to someone whom we think didn't work as hard as we have, we're actually showing that we still think salvation is earned in some way. Or at least we should get paid for what we do. I had a man come to me. I preached last Thursday night at CETA. And after the homeless shelter message on forgiveness, he came up to me and he said, I got no problem forgiving, forgiving other people. My problem is really accepting God's forgiveness for me because I really just don't feel worthy. Anybody else feel that way sometimes? Now, don't say yes because it's a trap. If you have to say yes, don't lie. But if you think that you're not worthy of receiving God's forgiveness, you still think your efforts tied into it some way. We're not worthy. None of us are worthy or will ever be worthy. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you think, well, I'm not worthy to receive it, you're still some way thinking that there's something you have to do to be worthy. Don't fall into that trap because that same mindset creeps into us after salvation. There are some of us who still think we should be rewarded for what we've done after salvation. I did for years. I've shared with you many a time how I knew my salvation was a gift by God and from God and I couldn't earn it. But I figured that everything I did after salvation, I've been busting my fanny and I was going to get a reward for it. And I never liked the idea of taking that crown and laying it at his feet because I was I had worked hard for those things I'm going to be rewarded for. But now I've come to realize Whatever he rewards me for, I didn't do. Go to Luke chapter 15. Tell me if this doesn't sound a little familiar. Go to Luke 15, verses 25 through 32. 
the story of the prodigal son. Let's look at the older brother real quick in Luke 15, verse 25. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and he drew near the house, he heard music and dancing, and he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he received him back safe and sound, but he was angry, and he refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. But he answered his father, look, these many years I have served you, and I never disobeyed your command. I'm a charter member. I have been faithful. I don't miss Sunday school. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. And he said to him, son, you're always with me and all that is mine is yours. It's fitting to celebrate and be glad for your, this. Your brother was dead and now he's alive. He was lost and he's found the older brother had been, quote unquote, faithful and dedicated and committed but he didn't know the heart of the Father. And you know why he didn't know the heart of the Father? It's evidenced in the fact that the heart of the Father toward the other brother wasn't the same heart that he had, which means he doesn't know the Father's heart. Secondly, the Father says, everything that I have is always all yours. All you have to do is receive it by faith, but you're still trying to work for it and slave for it, and you still don't get it. It's by my grace. It's received by faith. And folks, when you catch yourself comparing yourself with those hooligans out there that are looting, or you compare yourself with those people in the church that aren't working as hard as you, aren't as faithful as you, and I'm speaking to churches out here today, when you do that, you still think that you're working harder and you deserve more and you don't get it. Everything you'll be rewarded for is a gift of God and by His grace, just like your salvation. Yes, we're to store up reward. Yes, we're to be living for the life to come. Yes, He wants to shower us with blessings. By the way, the Bible says that in the future ages, He might display His glorious riches in Christ. Why? Because the more stuff that I'll be rewarded for will point even more and more to what? What Jesus has done. I want for Him to say, look at all that I've done. I want Him to say, look at all that I've done through Jim. I don't want to hear him say, I would have loved to have done more through Jim, but Jim wouldn't let me. I'm stealing his glory by not storing up reward in heaven. Go to Luke 17. We're in Luke 15. We have an older brother who thinks that he's worked and slaved and hadn't paid off. Look at Luke 17, verses 7 through 10. Jesus is speaking here, and in Luke 17, starting in verse 7, he says, will any of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at table? Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve me while I eat and drink? And afterwards you can eat and drink? Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. You see the attitude he's wanting from us? He's not wanting us, as we store up treasure in heaven, reward in heaven, to sit there keeping track so make sure that God's going to reward us and comparing everybody else and who's got more notches on their belt of how many people I've saved versus you or how much I've worked compared to you. Folks, it's time that we take our eyes off of each other and put them back on Jesus because the Bible says that God's looking for those who love Him and are fully devoted to Him. And if you're too busy comparing yourself with everybody else, your eyes are off of Jesus. Don't sit back and say, well, you know, I'll just do nothing until I get to heaven. The Bible says Jesus is going to lose reward and glory, and and you're losing a reward. But at the same time, don't think for a second that you're going to be considered better than somebody else. If he chooses to reward someone in heaven the same amount that he's rewarded you when you've been saved for 50 years and someone else just got saved like the thief on the cross the day before they died, and if he chooses to give them just as much reward in heaven as he gives you who's been on this earth for 50 years after salvation, praise him. He has every right to do it however he wants. And you just say, I'll just praise God for whatever he gives me. Because I want what he gives me to be pointing to him. You see the balance here? Seems like a curveball from going from store for reward to Hey, he may pay somebody else the same amount as you. Are you okay with that? You better be. Or else you really don't get the heart of God. We must understand this balance. 
God tells us to live for the life to come and to store up treasure in heaven, yet even though he'll reward us for faithful service, it is God who produced the fruit through us, and we should never think he owes us, and he definitely never owes us in comparison to our brothers, since all of this is by his grace. I'm going to read to you some scriptures as we close tonight. Go to Hebrews chapter 6. We've got five minutes to get four passages of scripture. I think we can do it. Hebrews chapter 6. Listen to these scriptures and please write them down and spend some time meditating on them. These passages deal with this balance that we just hopefully came to that conclusion. Hebrews chapter 6 verses 10 through 12. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who faith and patience inherit the promises. Did God rebuke Peter when he said, we've left everything? No. He is paying attention. He knows. He's not unjust. He's not overlooking it. He's keeping track. But don't think for a second that you've earned more than somebody else. Go to Romans 11. Look at verse 33 and following. We're going to go into chapter 12. All the way to verse 8, Romans chapter 11, verse 33, and following into chapter 12, verse 8. Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Don't be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many parts, and the parts don't all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another, and having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If it's prophecy, use it in proportion to your faith. If it's service, in our serving. And the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Do you see what he said? Everything is for God, by God, through God. We are never going to figure him out. He, you're not going to be his counselor. He doesn't owe you anything. But if you humble yourself on a daily basis and lay yourself on the altar and live for not this life but the life to come, he'll show you what his will is. And don't think of yourself more highly than you ought, but each humbly with sober judgment in accordance with the measure of faith that God's given you. You live the life God's got for you to live. And one day, he'll reward each of us accordingly. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Look at verse 12 through 17. I love how Paul understood this balance. He says in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 12, I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service, though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who are to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Did you see what he said? He had every right to send me to hell, but he chose not to. But he also took me, one of the worst, the chief of sinners, so that he could display his glory. Folks, you're probably going to see on the news tonight someone standing on a car throwing bombs into a, a, a bit place of business. And your heart in your flesh is going to want to hate them. Pray for them that God would reveal himself to them like he did to the Apostle Paul because he can take someone like that and bring more glory to himself. For the sake of time, 
Write down Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 and go look at it later on. It's a passage we looked at last week. When you truly grasp this truth, you'll never look down on the lost world, but you'll see them as God does. You'll not see yourself as better than anyone, but simply as a recipient of God's generous grace. I love you. See you next week. Thanks for